I request everyone to please keep their phone on silent mode or keep it switched off. Thank you. Dr. S. J. Shankar, Honorable Minister for External Affairs, Government of India, Admiral R. Hari Kumar, Chief of the Naval Staff of the Republic of India, Admiral Karambir Singh, Chairman of the National Maritime Foundation, and former Chief of the Naval Staff of the Republic of India, Vice Admiral Pradeep Chauhan, Director General, National Maritime Foundation, Mr. Ashok Nayar, Ms. Geeta Nayar, members of the family and close friends of the late Vice Admiral K.K. Nayar. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Good evening. My name is Divya Rai and I will be your host for this evening session. In common with all other echelons of the National Maritime Foundation, I find myself simultaneously humbled and proud to see that quite so many of you have taken the time and trouble to be here with us to commemorate and honor the many contributions of the late Vice Admiral K.K. Nayar. Admiral Nayar was a maritime strategist par excellence and founding chairman of the National Maritime Foundation. As such, he and his family, represented today by his son, Mr. Ashok Nayar, and his daughter, Ms. Geeta Nayar, will always have a special place in our individual and collective hearts. We are deeply honored today to have with us the Honorable External Affairs Minister, Dr. S. J. Shankar, who has very graciously consented to deliver this year's Vice Admiral K.K. Nayar Memorial Lecture. The Minister who has carved out time from his incredibly busy schedule to be with us, enjoys global renown and universal respect for his sagacity, wisdom and strategic acumen, and such is his fame that requires no introduction at all to this audience, including those ladies and gentlemen who are joining us online. Suffice it to say that he makes us all of us proud on a minute by minute basis. And now, without any further ado, may I request the Chairman of the National Maritime Foundation, 
and former chief of the naval staff of the republic of india admiral karambir singh to offer his introductory remarks thank you thank you divya dr jay shankar uh, honorable minister of external affairs admiral hari kumar chief of naval staff shri ashok nayar ms geeta nayar family friends and uh, family members of the late vice admiral kebal krishnan nayar vice admiral chauhan director general of uh, the nmf excellencies ladies and gentlemen good evening i stand amidst you uh, this evening to honor the memory of uh, vice admiral kk nayar who was a respected naval leader and the founding chairman of the national maritime foundation it's also with an abiding sense of honor and humility that i acknowledge the solidarity with the nmf uh, that each one of you is demonstrating by your presence today indeed uh, how better might we honor the passion of the late uh, admiral nayar that the late admiral nayar embodied than by gathering around us uh, other great minds and visionaries to keep alive the flame of advanced intellectual thinking that has for millennia uh, illuminated and typified india and it is in this context that i would particularly like to express my profound gratitude and that of all of us today uh, to dr jay shankar for carving time out of his incredibly busy schedule in order to deliver this year's memorial address i have had the good fortune of serving with the minister and i have benefited immensely from each and every interaction that i was uh, privileged to have with him our country is indeed fortunate to have a truly brilliant dynamic and visionary leader like him on the world stage in these tumultuous times thank you sir for joining us today uh, as an aside anyone who has not read his exceptionally outstanding work the india way must do so without delay i'm sure there are very few of you here our gratitude to admiral hari kumar the chief of naval staff for his unstinted support and continued guidance to the nmf thanks for making it here despite your very tight schedule i would like to thank uh, mr ashok nayar and ms geeta nayar the son and daughter of the late admiral for journeying all the way uh, from the us with a long stopover in heathrow to be with us uh, as also for their continued support to the foundation and all its endeavors we keenly miss the dynamic presence of uh, mrs veena nayar wife of the late admiral who continued and complemented his work with her own with equal passion and commitment i am confident that both these great souls are with us in spirit today and we seek their blessings and guidance as the nmf continues along the path so well lit by admiral nayar in the same vein i also wish to recognize and acknowledge the several echelons of uh, the indian defense forces as also the apex leadership of our sister think tanks uh, and other academic institutions and thank them for gracing this occasion a few words about admiral nayar admiral kewal krishnan nayar's contribution to matters maritime easily transcends the three and a half decades that uh, he spent in naval uniform his training both in the uk and the erstwhile uh, soviet union his multiple appointments in the plans director in naval headquarters his command of frontline warships uh, of the time the erstwhile rana and delhi his commands of both eastern and western fleet uh, his uh, contribution to higher defense management as the flag officer commanding in chief southern naval command and then as the vice chief of naval staff all coalesced to shape his panoramic vision and perspective of the world his retirement in 1986 was only a comma in his distinguished service and the next 3 decades or so of, uh, or uh, or so of his life too was driven by his enthusiasm to further the maritime development of india admiral nayar retained a remarkably clear idea of the path that maritime india needs to follow and he set about the task of paving that path in his official capacity as the member of the national security advisory board and and the government committee on defense expenditure after he left the government service his passion remained undiminished and he helped establish the national maritime foundation the observer research foundation vivekanand international foundation and the forum for strategic and security studies and his professional legacy 
is clearly visible in the invaluable input of each of them. So through these institutions and through the excellence of their work, Admiral Nair continues to live and thrive amidst us, sparking informed debate and reasoned discussion on a whole range of maritime matters of national importance. He remains a source of inspiration to generations of service officers, researchers, policy shapers, and the Indian polity at large. For my colleagues and myself, however, it's the establishment of the National Maritime Foundation in 2005 that is the most enduring manifestation of the late Admiral's abiding love for the Navy and the maritime domain. Consequently, we all draw immense satisfaction in the manner in which the NMF over the last 17 years has built upon Admiral uh, Nair's legacy, promoting maritime awareness and generating cogent policy prescriptions and recommendations through its studies and publications. So in conclusion, I'd like to state that it is enormously encouraging to see that under the stewardship of globally respected and influential leaders such as Dr. Jay Shankar, India's contemporary foreign policy has reacquired the distinctly maritime flavor that characterized it in the ancient and medieval times. Present here today are therefore eager to be informed and enriched by your globally acknowledged sagacity and wisdom. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, sir. May I now request Admiral R. Hari Kumar, Chief of the Naval Staff of the Republic of India, to offer his remarks. Dr. S. Jayashankar, Honorable External Affairs Minister, Admiral Karambir Singh, Chairman NMF, family members of Admiral K.K. Nair, Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege for me to welcome the Honorable External Affairs Minister for the Vice Admiral K.K. Nair Memorial Lecture being organized by the National Maritime Foundation today. The foundation was set up in 2005 and has rendered yeoman service over the past years, acting as a vital bridge between academic work and uh, policy strategy formulation. The Foundation's initiatives such as conduct of Indo-Pacific Regional Dialogue, publication of journals, books, and sustained engagement with the think tanks within the country as well as across the world, the contributions to India-driven constructs such, such as the Goa Maritime Conclave, the IONS, uh, have all played an invaluable role in this regard. As the knowledge partner of the Navy, the Foundation has retained focus on formulating workable policy solutions and its body of work is testimony to its vision to be the foremost resource center for the development and advocacy of strategies for the promotion and protection of India's national maritime interests. To my mind, it's a vision that needs to be pursued ever more proactively in the current geopolitical situation where, where we are transiting from a contested present to an uncertain future. The dynamics of this transition have been aptly summarized by Dr. S. Jayashankar in his seminal work, The India Way, and I quote, technology, connectivity, and trade are at the heart of the new contestations. In a more constrained and interdependent world, competition has to be pursued per force more intelligently, unquote. In the recent years, with the Honorable Minister at the Elm of Affairs, we have seen numerous instances where our diplomacy has concurrently been both firm and agile with single-minded focus on furthering India's national interests. As regards manifestation of diplomatic efforts in the maritime domain, Indian Navy's endeavors are guided by the Honorable Prime Minister's vision of saga, security and growth for all in the region, wherein the Navy has contributed by the evacuation of personnel, transshipment of uh, vaccines, liquid oxygen as part of operations Samudra Sedu 1 and 2, supply of food, medicines to our maritime neighbors oh, fuck off, yeah. of COVID, and uh, further protecting our mercantile marine to ensure trade security, capacity building of our friendly nations through setting up of coastal radar chains, 
providing operational assets, hydrographic surveys, surveillance of exclusive economic zones of our island nations, coordinated patrols to counter threats at sea, uh, training for their personnel, uh, being the first responder towards maritime security and HADR in the Indian Ocean region. They're all the various ways through which maritime diplomacy con continues to contribute to the national endeavors with the help of the maritime forces. In the recent past, the conceptualization, uh, concept conceptualization of the Indo-Pacific Ocean Initiative and chairing of a high-level open debate on enhancing maritime security in the UN Security Council by the Honorable Prime Minister are potent indicators of increased emphasis on matters maritime in the diplomatic endeavors. I'm sure we'll hear more about this from the Honorable Minister who's been pivotal to these endeavors. It will help us understand the nuances of how India's diplomacy has transformed in the last few years and what the future trajectory may look like. Thank you. Jai Hind. Thank you, sir. May I now request the Honorable Minister to take the floor and enlighten us all. Thank you. Admiral Harikumar, Admiral Karambir Singh, Admiral Chauhan, Ambassador Raskotra, uh, Mr. Members of the Nayar family, uh, dear friends, and it's wonderful to see so many familiar faces in front of me. It's really a great pleasure to address the Marit National Maritime Foundation, and it is a particular honor to be asked to deliver the Admiral K.K. Nayar Memorial Lecture for 2022. My subject today is on the emergence of the Indo-Pacific uh, and making a case for the Quad. I believe it is a timely one too, given that a Quad summit uh, took place in Tokyo just a week ago. And the NMF is a particularly appropriate forum to share these thoughts because it has been a pioneer on the concept of the Indo-Pacific and very much a participant in the ensuing debates. And this is, of course, quite natural, given that so much of the discussion pertains to areas of interest to it, be it maritime security, well-being of oceans, global cooperation, or a rules-based order. Now, the Indo-Pacific as a theater and the Quad as a platform are among the recent additions to our strategic lexicon. They matter less for their novelty than, they, than that they reflect the aspects of the global changes underway. Understandably, they have been the subject of debate and in some quarters, even of polemics. In many ways, the Quad is a tale of a grouping foretold. Once the constraints of the Cold War were removed in strategic calculations, three of India's important relationships, that with the US, Japan and Australia, started to unfold more naturally. The cumulative impact is what we are seeing now. It could even be asserted that the Quad symbolizes the larger direction that the world is moving. Now, consider really how much the world has changed in the last quarter century. There is the rise of China, there is the growth of India, an economic rebalancing with Asia as a driver, the end of the Cold War, changes in the top 20 economies, developments in American and British politics and European politics too. And this list could just go on. But it is much more than the sum of its parts because we have witnessed quantum shifts along with more organic change. Connecting the dots, we really seem today to be on the cusp of something big. And as we discern the outlines of what emerges next, there is no question that the Indo-Pacific is at its core. Those who contemplate the changes in this geography might actually find it instructive 
to compare them to developments in Europe three decades ago, even though Asia has been more dynamic than Europe. Its regional architecture is actually far more conservative. Part of that emanates from the fact that Europe was very much at the heart of the Cold War and felt its termination much more directly. The fall of the Berlin Wall opened up the ground for strategic experimentation that led to the expanded European Union as we know it now. In contrast, there has been no such seminal development in Asia and the Indo-Pacific. On the contrary, this was actually an era of steady economic progress with an accompanying political stability. Moreover, the region is a vaster expanse with greater diversity and a less collective persona than Europe. Till recently, neither an overarching scenario was visible nor a need felt for a shared response. To the extent an agreed meeting point was required, this was provided by ASEAN-driven platforms. The underpinning to the larger stability provided by a pervasive American presence also helped to keep this theater steady till recently. It is now the revisiting of these assumptions that has started to shape the emergence of the Indo-Pacific. To begin with, there is the reality of the strategic repositioning of the United States. Call it America first or a foreign policy for the middle class. The differences in responsibilities, resources, activities and attitude are not possible to obfuscate. The United States is undeniably the premier power of our times. Indeed, such is its centrality to the current order that be it an ally, a competitor or the agnostic or even the undecided, none of us can really be indifferent to its posture. There are different ways by which the US is itself coming to terms with its new constraints and its current challenges, where the US as an entrenched power is understandably struggling, is in respect of new manifestations of exerting influence and wielding power. But what is important to recognize is that in its own unique manner, the American polity is also going through a serious introspection. Among its policy changes are a greater emphasis on burden sharing and an openness to partners beyond established relationships. Its search for global stability leads it to contemplate a new form of plurilateralism. The second big driver of the changes we see around us is, of course, the impressive growth of Chinese power. There are three autonomous aspects to this phenomenon. The first is the enormous expansion of Chinese capabilities in virtually every field. The second is a projection pattern that changed beginning with 2009 and more vigorously after 2012. The third, and this was particularly apparent during the pandemic, is China's deep relevance to the global economy. They have propelled radical economic and strategic rebalancing in the global order. The United States, as the dominant power, is the most affected on all counts. Equally, they have had an influence on the rules and practices of the current order, the management of the global commons, and the nature of world politics. None of that is surprising, given that the combined import of these changes have been multiplied by their focus leveraging. Such seamlessness exhibited abroad is a reflection both of a tightly integrated worldview as well as a domestic outlook. So let us be clear that this is not just about the rise of another power, however major. We have actually entered a new phase in international relations and naturally the resonance is felt most strongly in its immediate vicinity. Now, these developments centering around the United States and China are largely responsible for the concept of the Indo-Pacific taking root so rapidly. They have fundamentally shaken the old normal, but not yet created a new one. The region 
has come to understand that it cannot be insulated from the relationship, nor indeed indifferent to what it portends for global goods. What this has in common with a very dissimilar situation in Europe a generation ago is that geopolitical shifts are redefining the very contours of the landscape. In Europe, it happened when American power was at its peak, encouraging a generosity of that con of, that overcame the continents of that con uh, that overcame the cautions of that continent's history. In the Indo-Pacific, in contrast, it is a very different story where it is now the limitations of American abilities that have triggered a rethinking. But both in their own way have encouraged a greater sense of collectivism. It was also inevitable that such a significant transformation in the relative weight, influence and behavior of players should lead to a reimagining of the arena itself. The irony is that those who are projected as taking the lead are actually coming to terms with a scenario that the fortunes of others have created. Now, history provides adequate evidence about how integrated economic and cultural activities really have been between the Indian and the Pacific Oceans. By its very nature, the maritime domain supersedes artificial barriers and man-made lines. Whether it is trade or faith, monuments or relationships, we know that its community traversed the waters over the ages with great comfort. Assigning labels and restricting activities is actually a relatively modern phenomenon. In this particular case, the sharp differentiation within the Indo-Pacific was very much a result of the outcomes of 1945. In fact, it has a very specific American signature to it that is highlighted by America's preoccupations in the Far East. Among the milestones were the Second World War itself, the revolution in China, the Korean War, the revival of Japan, and the Vietnam War. As a result, it was very quickly forgotten, it was very quickly forgotten between the 1940s and the 1960s, that much of what happened in that theater was actually driven by forces residing in the Indian Ocean. To that extent, there is again a similarity to the Europe of the previous era. The fact is that the interests of a great power distort the landscape and create concepts for its convenience. And here too, the wheel of history has started to turn and old habits have started to reassert themselves. Debates about the Indo-Pacific have sometimes seen charges that it derives from Cold War thinking. This is not just motivated and false. It is made by the very quarters who seek to freeze the status quo of 1945 and deny the integration that has happened in the last two decades. Their endeavor is to constrain the choices of others and impose their interests instead. Aggressive rhetoric is aimed at exerting pressure to conform. Indeed, the very binary mindset that underlies this argument is a carryover from an era that has gone by. The Indian Ocean may have been relegated to a strategic backwater for seven decades after the Second World War, but it is today not only a critical global lifeline, but one smoothly fusing into the waters of the Pacific. In fact, the actions of major powers active in the Indo-Pacific speaks volumes of what are the real and very integrated calculations. So if you judge nations by what they do rather than what they preach, the picture is very clear. At the end of the day, the compulsions of interdependence and interpenetration have triumphed over outdated definitions and vested interest. So let's be clear about one thing. The Indo-Pacific is the future, not the past. A significant contribution to the change in the landscape has been made by India's Act East policy. Three decades ago, India adopted a more open economic model 
that help forge closer ties with the ASEAN and Northeast Asia. In due course, this opening acquired other dimensions, including those of connectivity, security, education, and societal exchanges. Domains of activity may be different, but starting from the 1990s, India's ties with the ASEAN, Japan, South Korea, and China developed far greater substance and consequently higher priority. Australia was a subsequent happening, but the political and security convergences allowed this relationship to play catch up very readily. What began for India as a solution for an economic crisis has actually finally ended up as a strategic correction. Today, India travels, trades, and interacts much more to the East than it has done since its independence. Here too, there is a falling back to history, given the long tradition of Indian maritime activity and cultural presence, going all the way to the Fujian coast of China. As we assess the emerging Indo-Pacific, its policy consequences are obviously at the core of our, the strategic debate. From our perspective, an Indian embedding in ASEAN-led structures over decades has created a regular and comfortable interface with all the players. In fact, as India's vistas kept broadening eastwards, economic stakes were supplemented by political and security relationships, especially with those who nursed common interests. It could be a global forum like the G20 or a regional one like the Indian Ocean Rim Association. All of them provided opportunities for greater socialization. Even otherwise, those with a similar outlook and shared values tend to congregate together. But when the entire region grapples with new issues and different capacities, then the desire to do so gets stronger. At the heart of the Quad is a level of comfort generated by the marked improvement in multiple sets of bilateral relationships. This is enhanced by a stronger sense of converging purpose in the face of regional and global challenges. Obviously, the collective ease is based on shared interests and similar characteristics, but all of this was also required because the resistance to reforming international organizations and the limitations of regional ones compelled a search for practical solutions. That, in essence, is the case for the Quad. The origins of the Quad actually go back to the coordination among the same four countries to respond to the 2004 tsunami in the Indian Ocean. And I'm sure there are many people in the room who have memories uh, of that experience. Uh, subsequent conversations led to a diplomatic gathering of uh, their representatives in 2007. This did not progress further as none of the participants was really prepared to invest sufficient political capital in the initiative at that point of time. The natural question therefore is what has changed between 2007 and 2017 when the Quad in a more serious incarnation assembled in New York. The current Quad is a cumulative product of several developments. Among them, the change capabilities of key players, a more integrated arena, an emerging vacuum on global issues, and a greater openness to look beyond orthodox constructs. But the real difference is the enormous progress that some of the relevant bilateral relations have made in this very decade. The other three nations, US, Japan, Australia, the other three nations have already strong relationships with each other, though these two have discernibly improved during this period. But what they did not have in 2007 was the degree of convergence and cooperation with India, which they attained by 2017. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is my critical point. It is the story of these changed relationships that we must seek the explanation for the rapid development of the Quad. So let us start with the United States. The current phase of our ties 
can be traced back uh, to President Clinton's visit in 2000. That in turn was very much the result of uh, effective management of the political consequences of the 1998 nuclear test. Now, it is essential that this starting point be duly recognized because it confirms that India and the United States actually upgraded the relationship, seeing intrinsic value in doing so. This was still, if you remember, this was still the era of the dot-com revolution and the H-1B visa. American dominance, global dominance was pronounced and there was really no balance of power argument that was driving American strategy at that time. It was in fact the improving prosperity, the expanding talent, the larger global exposure of India that made it a better partner in American eyes. In many ways, this was a natural progression of the relationship once the constraints of the Cold War era ended. Suggesting that these ties do not have their own merit and must necessarily be directed against others is actually to exercise a veto on India's choices. This is all the more contestable given how some nations leverage their own relationship with the United States so enthusiastically in the past when it suited them. Obviously, when a judgment is given by any party that has a stake in the outcome, this must be seen for what it is. Now, progress in India-US ties accelerated during the Bush administration, which correctly identified the nuclear impediment as a major obstacle to serious cooperation. By this time, both sides wanted a more normal relationship freed from the encumbrances and the impediments and the assumptions of the past. They therefore proceeded determinedly in that direction, successfully addressing domestic political challenges in both countries in that process. The realization of the India-US nuclear deal widened the pathway to greater shared endeavors. That five successive American presidents starting from Clinton till Biden, five successive American presidents who are so different from each other have been united in the pursuit of better ties with India has actually been the real game changer. That consistency, I should add, also holds true for the Indian end. Uh, as a result, a relationship that was earlier notable for its argumentation and distancing has undergone a complete transformation. The two decades which witnessed such significant developments in respect of the US also saw steady progress with Japan. Challenges for India on this account were however very different. Unlike the US, Japan did not have a history of leaning towards Pakistan during the Cold War. For reasons rooted in history and culture, there was in fact a proclivity in Japan, in Japanese politics, for India. The paradox of the relationship was that the very lack of issues also limited high-level attention. As with many other states, India-Japan ties also came up against the difficult realities of India during this period. Economically, a traditionally broad presence of Japanese companies failed to, to strike deep roots in the absence of a welcoming environment. The thinness of the interface was not limited only to business. It also extended to supportive activities that Japan normally encourages. Whether it was education, culture, or travel, the two nations continue to remain pleasantly and politely distant. The political domain was not particularly helpful either. There was already the compulsion of the Cold War that pulled the two countries in opposing directions. The non-linear path taken by this relationship as well, when India's nuclear tests in 1998 actually shook it out of complacency. Just as President Clinton's visit marked the turning point in one relationship, that of Pres Prime Minister Mori uh, did in the other. And interestingly, while President Bush took it to a higher level in regard to the US, Prime Minister Rabe did so even more personally in respect of Japan. His famous 
the confluence of two C's speech to the Indian Parliament in 2007 was not only a seminal moment for the bilateral relationship, but an early vision of what emerged as the Indo-Pacific. The context for that is also worth recalling, especially today. A decade and a half ago, Japan too was contemplating an increasingly uncertain external environment that required it to resume, assume greater responsibilities. Given its complex history, this naturally was accompanied by an involved domestic debate. But a society with a broader agenda, taking greater interest in the world, will naturally look for more partners. And India, no longer encumbered by the Cold War, offered obvious opportunities. Some of this was a regional convergence, some a shared quest for a better representation in the UN some a natural empathy of democratic societies. So here too, the bilateral wheels began to move on their own logic. And as they gathered greater traction, the vistas of cooperation also broadened. The relationship which has developed most visibly in recent times is that with Australia. As in the case of US and Japan, the 1998 nuclear test did impact these ties as well, and the road to recovery, quite honestly, was not an easy one. But the Australia relationship also carried its own pre-existing issues. It says something about, I suppose, both of us, that the first ever prime ministerial visit from India to Australia took two full decades after independence. This was when Indira Gandhi visited in 1968. Australia was the most distant of our Anglosphere partners. Uh, it in fact uh, shared the attitude of the US on issues east of India and the approach of the UK to the concerns west of India. The Commonwealth legacies, however, ensured that there were steady exchanges in different domains, including defense, commerce, training and education. What was a substantial but not a priority relationship uh, took a clear dip, took a clear hit, very honestly, in 1998. The, it took the visit of uh, Deputy Prime Minister Tim Fisher in 1999 to see a thaw, leading thereafter to the visits of Foreign Minister Downer and Prime Minister Hubbard in March and July of 2000. The return to normalcy progressed steadily and was accelerated somewhat by the tailwinds of the nuclear deal in 2005. But the reality was that for almost a decade, it was actually left to civil society and market forces to run this relationship. And it was not until you had the two-way visits in 2014 of Prime Ministers Abbott and Modi that the gates for cooperation with Australia really opened up. The new intensity of this interaction was visible and I think the one we had uh, two years ago, a very successful Modi-Morrison virtual summit. And since then, actually, there's been a tradition of regular PM level conversations. And uh, suddenly, a previously distant relationship now covered an annual meeting of prime ministers, a foreign ministers dialogue, a two plus two defense foreign ministers dialogue, a trade ministerial commission, education council, energy dialogue. So you can see we've really been working very, very hard uh, on this account. Clearly, the days of attention deficit were over with a vengeance. The recent milestones in this ties actually bring out how interactive and dynamic uh, this process has been and uh, greater political confidence and stronger defense cooperation in fact saw the participation of australia in exercise malabar 2020 and subsequently a better understanding on the space applications front led to australian support for a temporary telemetry tracking and command center for the gaganyan mission a shared concern about trade reliability and economic volatility encouraged an initiative called Supply Chain Resilience Initiative along with Japan. And we actually negotiated and concluded a free trade agreement in record time uh, in 2022. And I would say this is an outcome actually of what by now is a larger systemic confidence. 
the Quad Summit, the recent Quad Summit in Tokyo, provided an opportunity to confirm that the new Albanese government is just as committed to this relationship as its predecessors. So with this background, I want to speak briefly about the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative because I do believe it is also something that the NMF should be focusing more on in the coming days. Now, for those of you who are not aware, it was announced by Prime Minister Modi in 2019 and it holds particular interest as an actually an additional platform for cooperation with all the Quad partners. Uh, this is envisaged as an open, non-treaty based inclusive platform for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific region and it is intended actually to work in tandem with other uh, pre-existing formats, ASEAN, IRA, BIMSTEC, IOC, PIF, etc. It has seven pillars, maritime security, maritime ecology, uh, the maritime resources, capacity building and re resource sharing, disaster risk uh, reduction and management, as well as science and technology, academic cooperation, trade connectivity and maritime transfer. Now, each one of these pillars act has a supposed to have a lead partner. So far, Australia has agreed to lead the maritime ecology pillar, Japan, the connectivity and transportation one, France and Indonesia, the maritime resources one, uh, and I believe the most latest is the UK as the maritime security pillar. Uh, now, how the IPOI will develop, of course, remains to be seen, but certainly this is one example of fresh thinking on regional partnerships that has the potential to take the Indo-Pacific forward. That the ASEAN, European Union and individual nations have all in the meanwhile actually tabled their own Indo-Pacific vision and approaches also augurs well for the future. There is similarly a natural comfort for Australia in perceiving greater Indian interest in collaborating uh, where the Pacific Islands are concerned. So let me come back to the Quad. The Quad are all democratic polities, market economies, pluralistic societies. There is a natural understanding, a similarity in structural aspects of the relationship, which has actually helped to foster a platform. In each case, there are regular summits. In each case, between Quad partners, uh, there are regular summits. There are regular meetings at the summit level, which are designated formally as uh, annual in the case of India and Australia and India and Japan. Uh, all the bilateral relations now have a two plus two defense foreign ministers format. All four countries are members of ASEAN led forums, including East Asia Summit, ARF, the ADMM plus. They also all strongly subscribe to the centrality of the ASEAN insofar as the Indo-Pacific is concerned. Between them, uh, they are involved between them, the quad, four quad members, they're involved in multiple trilateral combinations with other partners and all of them offer mutual logistics support and work on white shipping, which obviously enables better maritime security coordination. And last but not least, their shared commitment to UNCLOS 1982 as the constitution of the seas is extremely relevant. Now, the working of the court takes into account the consequences of globalization and the requirements of the global commerce. There is undoubtedly a strong shared interest in the oceanic domain, as all members are maritime powers. In fact, well before the revival of the court, they were conducting the Malabar exercises between themselves. And the same convergence is now underlined in the support that they have expressed together recently in Tokyo for the Indo-Pacific Partnership on Maritime Domain Awareness. But significant as this may be, any unidimensional projection does injustice to a group that can make a serious contribution to larger welfare. It is therefore essential that all of us have an informed visibility of the entire quad landscape and it and uh, as you will see, or rather hear, this does span a very broad range of issues. Where critical and emerging technologies are concerned, the Quad adopted in 2021 principles on technology design, development, governance and use. The adoption of the ORAN Action Plan encouraged a diverse, 
open and interoperable telecommunication system. This was followed by an agreement to facilitate exchanges and align closely on ORAN testing, as well when we were in Tokyo on 5G supplier diversification. The Quad obviously has an interest in expansive deployment in the Indo-Pacific of the ORAN. In, in parallel, there have been discussions on the global semiconductor chain, semiconductor value chain, that the Quad members have come up with a common statement on technology supply chain principles also says a lot about the importance that they attach to this domain. Climate action <clears throat> has been another significant area of attention. Here too, the Quad has applied itself to practical initiatives. The green shipping network uh, between the four is dedicated to greening and decarbonizing the shipping value chain. It is actually the Quad objective to finally establish green shipping corridors in the Indo-Pacific. India has a particular interest uh, in the collective efforts underway on green hydrogen. This is expected to dovetail with its own national mission uh, and uh, uh, therefore our quad collaboration is important. Uh, we have also partnered on the coalition for the disaster resilient infrastructure. Uh, among the ambitious goals in the sector is to collectively advance climate monitoring and disaster risk reduction in the Indo-Pacific. Infrastructure has been another natural focus given the widespread unease generated by more opaque connectivity initiatives. Uh, in so far as the Quad is concerned, again in Tokyo, there was an agreement, there was a commitment uh, to put $50 billion in investment in infrastructure over the next five years. Given the inherited challenges, much of the deliberations on debt management and debt sustainability in the Quad are assuming serious proportions. We again have an agreement to establish a port portal on debt management resources. Quad debt development uh, assistance institutions are already working together on sustainable and alternative financing. And there is a clear recognition today that high standard infrastructure based on transparency and market principles should be promoted for the larger benefit of the region. Given the pandemic, it is also natural, it is only to be expected that the Quad would come together where vaccines were concerned. Uh, and we have actually seen uh, both the production of WHO approved vaccines as well as expanded manufacturing capacities by Quad countries. Uh, early regulatory uh, approvals would naturally expedite the delivery of these supplies. Quad works closely with COVAX to track supply and demand and with WHO to overcome vaccine hesitancy. On its part, India has provided more than half a million made in India vaccine doses to Cambodia and Thailand under a Quad vaccine partnership. Other notable areas of cooperation have been Quad data satellite portal and STEM fellowships. The analysis of climate change risks and sustainable use of oceans and marine resources is also very high on the Quad agenda. A different cluster of issues illustrate the contribution that Quad can make to keep the world and themselves safe, secure and protected. An important outcome from Tokyo was the HADR partnership for the Indo-Pacific. This also has a symbolic resonance given the 2004 tsunami cooperation that I recalled. At the time when climate events are proliferating and global responses are declining, this will fill a significant gap. Counterterrorism is another domain of cooperative activity, starting with policy exchanges and experience sharing the potential for mutual benefit, I think, in, in, is being rapidly explored. So, uh, the cybersecurity is also emerging as a productive area of work. Shared, uh, sharing model approaches, encouraging development of talent, ensuring supply chain resilience uh, and security of networking uh, industries are its prominent facets. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me come conclude with the objective of the Quad, even though I have, in a sense, dwelt on it at great length. In the words of Prime Minister Narendra Modi, it is actually to do global good. The need for that to be a collaborative event, uh, effort is self-evident. It is equally natural that 
nations with significant capacities and shared interests would step forward in response to the need of the day. That India should be one of them makes sense given how much uh, we have grown in the last three decades. But for this to happen through partnerships with three quad countries was not always a given. It can unfold today because painstaking efforts are made over many years to strengthen the bilateral relationships that are the real building blocks. But even that by itself was not adequate. It took considerable openness of mind in all of the Quad leaderships to envisage collaboration in a more contemporary manner. Practical progress has validated the relevance of the sensible approach. If Quad is to continue growing, and I have every confidence it would, we must also be cognizant of what we should not do. Trying to straitjacket it, subjecting it to a stress test, or imposing congruence over convergence are all harmful, not helpful. The Quad works precisely because it is flexible and understanding a welcome departure from the rigidities of the Cold War radar. The Quad is, in many ways, the aggregate of the progress India has made in the key relationships over two decades. It is also an assertion of going beyond traditional confines and defeating the mind games of our competitors. That it has opened up new vistas should encourage us to be confident and ensure that our national interests and our national interests alone continues to determine policy making. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. To lend an intensely personal and poignant touch to our gratitude to the minister, I yield the floor to Mr. Ashok Tayar. Thank you. Honorable Minister Dr. Jay Shankar, Admiral Karambir Singh, uh, Admiral Hari Kumar, Admiral Chauhan, uh, Ambassador Laskotra, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to thank you on behalf of my sister and I for taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to attend the Vice Admiral KK Nair Memorial Lecture. Uh, I'm sure you uh, enjoyed the really substantive presentation uh, that Dr. Jay Shankar just gave uh, you know, to us. I found it particularly useful. I'm sure you did too. Dr. Jay Shankar, your presence and the topic you covered today uh, would have meant a lot to my father. My father was first and foremost an extremely proud Indian who wanted to see India stand tall and achieve the preeminence and importance that it has in the world today under Prime Minister Modi and your tenure. He was a strong supporter of the Prime Minister and his philosophy for many years and was always a proponent of not measuring India by Western benchmarks. I'm also sure my father will be thumping the table loudly from the heavens in response to many of your interactions uh, with other global powers and the Western press. On a personal note, my father held your father, Dr. Subramanian, in the highest regard. I recall him taking me to attend lectures of his close friend, Subu, at the IDSA, where he informed me that Dr. Subramanian was the foremost defense strategist of his time with unmatched brilliance. I believe everyone will agree with me that you have inherited the same brilliance from your father. I would also like to thank Admiral Karambi Singh and the NMF Admiral Singh, my father is truly grateful to you, or my family is truly grateful to you for the meaningful contributions 
you have made us you made a cns to an institution that was close to my father's heart the navy we also truly appreciate the courtesies you extended to our late mother Veena Nair. Once again, thank you all for coming. And I would like to ask Admiral Johan to close the south. Dr. Jay Shankar, <clears throat> excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm sure many of you have attended uh, sessions that are hard acts to follow. <clears throat> I find myself in a position of having an impossible act to follow. So I just wanted to uh, perhaps sink it down to its essence, and that is to say thank you. I would like to thank profusely uh, the Honorable Minister for an utterly scintillating uh, and content-rich presentation. I have known and had the privilege of interacting with Dr. Jayashankar for many years, and I can truly say that I have at least grown under his tutelage. I hope to continue to do so in the future. Uh, I would like to express my gratitude on all our behalfs to the Chief of the Naval Staff, who has uh, unstintingly supported the NMF. Very often we have put him in untenable situations and he has never ever let us down. So thank you very much, sir. Uh, how can I not uh, say thank you to Admiral uh, Karambir Singh, whose uh, chairmanship uh, drives the NMF into its present high traction mode, both nationally as well as internationally. That brings us to the true gurus of the National Maritime Foundation. You, not only you, gentlemen who are in the physical audience here today, but also those of us, those of you who are in uh, virtual online mode. Thank you. Thank you also for uh, agreeing to sustain the sartorial elegance for which the National Maritime Foundation is known, unmindful of the kind of weather that we experience. Last but not the least, let me say a special thank you to my fellow heads of think tanks. We have a large collection here, uh, ranging in alphabetical range from A to at least V, if not more, so Ananta to uh, Vivekanand and everybody in between. And I do think that the NMF uh, is enriched by your presence, as indeed are we all. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you and Jai Hind. And lest you think that we have forgotten old naval traditions, cocktails will now follow.